so weak this week on RuPaul's Drag Race. You know, I love the Evolve. Plus, I really love Halloween, so it was easy. Oh, hey! Hi! It's me! Well, my finger do with a finger do review of RuPaul's Drag Race Season 11, Episode 5. And all I have to say is, Jorge, drink me! Ooh, look at you with another fancy drink. All right, this is another cocktail from Wilma's Signature Cocktail. I'm so sorry. Uh, you can make this yourself. I got the recipe down below, but even better, you can mix this along with me at home if you're a Patreon uh, subscriber, a Patreon subscriber. Uh, I For $5 a month, you can see all of my drink tutorials. That's five so far, including this one. I'm so serious. This is the Poison Apple. Let me give it a taste. Mmm! I'm serious. If if Snow White's stepmother had given her one of these instead of a real poison apple, she may have got a Mother's Day card. I'm just saying. Okay, so let's get to it. Well, we started the episode off by saying goodbye to M.I.D. Finally, poor sweet thing. And the queens did say bye to her, but then they congratulated themselves quite quickly for surviving another week. Another person who congratulated themselves right out of the gate was Scarlett M.D. She seemed to be very, very proud of Rue's compliment on her casting job for the Rusical. And rightly so. She could have been a total biatch and done all sorts of things, like made a skinny white girl Oprah, or, or, or made talky ganache Shandy, and then really seen if she'd done good or bad, I'm just saying. So here's to Scarlet Envy tooting her own horn. So you should, because you know, girl, <laughs> none of those queens in that room are going to toot it for you. They're busy tooting it themselves, I'm so sorry. And finally, the big news this week, Brangie, which is what they're calling uh, Brooklyn and Vangie. Although, I personally, I think they should have called them Van Lynn. Van Lynn would have been nice, I don't know. But Brangie is now official. They're out of the closet. People can now officially make jokes about them uh, and, and uh, uh, make fun of their love or lust or maybe just subtle infatuation. Personally, for me, I just think it's lovely that they're doing that at all. Because seriously, life is too short. You've got to grab it while it's being presented to you. Even when it's not, I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. You know who wasn't cute? Evie coming for Raja the way she did. Like, just a side, like, side check into the boards. That's a hockey reference. I'm just um, it just seemed to me uh, that she just came out of left field with it. Now, here's the thing. When you tell somebody something and they didn't ask you, that's confrontational. I think that's confrontational. Unless, of course, it's your very good friend and you very quietly pull them aside and say, mm, your fly's down. Or, mm, don't wear that, you'll get sent to the bottom too. Something like that. But when it comes to a competition, uh, it's not your place to tell people anything. It's not their place to listen to you. And I don't, I'm not saying Edie's wrong. I agree with her. I am sick and tired of these queens who say, if I have to lip sync for my life, then I'm going to, which basically translates to, well, I'm just going to have to ask this challenge. And if I have to lip sync, I'm okay to lip sync. I'm a good lip syncer. Uh, and Evie's right. RuPaul is not going to have a winner of RuPaul's Drag Race be somebody who half-assed it through the competition and, and, and pulled it out of the bag in the last minute during a lip sync. I'm so serious. But that doesn't mean it's Evie's place to say it. Plus, you know, Evie's young. She's in that age we all were, whether we remember it or not, where we felt that we knew everything and everyone else was an idiot. Uh, and I think she's in that phase right now where she has to tell everybody what she thinks and, and, and who, who's doing stuff wrong and stuff like that, even though nobody asked her. And I'm just going to say this again. Uh, you know, it's one thing to give somebody some complimentary criticism or constructive criticism. That's fine. But when you just come at somebody and ask them when they're going to start applying their life lessons to any or all of the challenges, you're looking for a fight. And apparently people from D Dallas are to be feared. I didn't know. The next day in the workroom, there were squeals of laughter as the girls continued to ridicule Brangy and their love. Uh, but those squeals of laughter turned to squeals of plain old squeals when Nina West got all up in Taki's ganache, I'm so serious. It was a little early in the day for me, is all I'm saying. So I was super, super glad that Rue showed up to distract us all from uh, that. Uh, and, of course, she distract us with this week's mini-challenge, which she had company for. It wasn't an easy uh, mini-challenge. She, she needed help. Not just two, one person, two. First of all, she brought her doll. And why wouldn't she? It's stunning. But she also brought our favorite living doll, Trixie Mattel, to help 
pitched this idea. The mini challenge was that the girls had to create a new best friend doll for Rue's doll. Easy enough. So they were given a uh, uh, quicker, uh, less quick drag, 20 minutes, and after five minutes for this test, because after all, we're talking about RuPaul's doll's new best friend. You just don't slap a face on that one sometimes. Personally, I thought everyone did an excellent job, but my faves and standouts definitely. First off, Nina as Gloria Freebush with those pants that were so lippy. I'm so serious. Uh, the other queen I really like because she surprised me by making this drink, Akira. Akira with her, what was it, Inmate 304, was it? It was hilarious. It was a slash. She took her wig off. Oh. And she, she's armed, well, just the one arm. It was so funny. Good for her. Good to see you, Akiri. I know you've been kind of stuck in the middle there, but I've been watching you. I know you got some stuff there, I'm just saying. And finally, Raja's star, Keisha Labooty Raja, uh, was the doll of the week. I have to say, the minute I saw her big cup of drink, I knew it was over. That was the winner. And she was. And good for Raja. Although, I'm sorry that it didn't give her any kind of leg up in the challenge, I'm just saying. Which was a ball. A monster ball. They had three looks that they had to throw down that runway. Three looks. Eleven queens. Oh, I'm glad I got a cocktail, I'm just saying. Mm. The first category was Trampy Trick or Treat. Or something sexy, something naughty, something tongue-in-cheek, or wherever it fits, I don't know. Uh, the second category was Witch, Please. Which I felt, I'm, I'm inspired by Edie's witch. I just thought she did such a good job. Just um, and then the final category was Milf Eleganza. Monsters I'd like to freak or basically have sex with is what I'm saying. So, uh, immediately, the girls got to work. Taki got right to work, passing all her ideas by her dream girls, a.k.a. Vanji and Akiria. I had no idea that was a thing or that they were doing that. But good for them. It's always nice to have friends, I'm just saying. Let's just hope it doesn't become another world. <laughs> That's good talk to say, seriously. Uh, the other thing that Taki seemed to have no problem doing with the Dream Girls was saying that if she had to lip sync, she was ready. Evie went right to explaining how Taki was never going to win uh, RuPaul's Drag Race just based on her personality alone. Not that Evie's given any of this a lot of thought, you understand. Seriously. And Brooklyn Heights went right to supporting her new flame, Vanji, and getting some sugar. Although, neither queens are going to let a little side action distract them from the crap. Thank God Ru popped back in to get those queens on track. The first queen she popped in to say hi to was Miss Nina, who immediately embarrassed herself with a miscasting of murder she sat down and wrote. I had no idea of Rue Lover. I have to tell you, I love a murder sugar. Rue also got right to the monster in the room with Sugar Cane by pointing out she hasn't won any challenges yet. And this was not a week to say that to Ms. Kane. I'm so serious. God bless her. I mean, here's a girl who's given up all, she worked her whole life to this point doing one thing. She worked whatever her job was. I Finance, banking, I don't know what she did. Six-figure deal. She gave up a six-figure job to insert herself in a contest that could win her six figures. There's something very, very poetic about that, I'm just saying. Uh, and that said also, good for Sugar, you know, regardless of how she does on RuPaul's Drag Race, she's in a position now in life where she can focus on drag and not worry about stuff six figures. You know, she got a she got a house somewhere. She's okay. That's sure. Here's to you, sure. Seriously. I'm having trouble. I have to say, I'm with Rue. I'm super impressed with Brooklyn Heights sewing skills after only a year and a half. Do you see, children? Listen to your auntie woman. It doesn't take that long to learn how to sew. And a year and a half, she's put some skills to the test is what I'm saying. Good for her. Uh, I'm very impressed with Brooklyn. What I wasn't impressed with, though, was her description of what her MILF was going to be. It sounded very involved. It sounded very complicated. And it sounded like it would take a lot of time. Although I have to say, the the crown made of faces of the other contestants of a beauty pageant, hilarious. I would have liked to have seen it, but I'm glad she changed her mind. And I'd like to point out that Brooklyn was, where's my Canadian flag? Have I said her name also, but I haven't even said it yet? All right, I, Brooklyn, I owe a couple, so I'm going to keep flapping it. 
Um, I was very impressed with Brooklyn for uh, listening to what Rue wasn't saying, what her face was giving her, which was basically uh, a hate your costume idea. I'm so glad that, that Brooklyn picked up on it and was the bigger queen to actually allow her idea to go and to start with something else. Because not a lot of queens do that, and every queen who hasn't ends up at the bottom or close to it, I'm just saying. Yay, Brooklyn. I can't believe you didn't let me win. I've been here how since the Jorge. One thing was certain when Rue visited Plasti Tiara, she was very confident in this week's challenge, and so she should be. First of all, Plasti Tiara is a look queen, and I mean that in the best way possible. She is able to turn out these looks, and she's a great sewer. She really is. Uh, and, and you combine the two of those, this challenge was made for her. And I'm so glad that she uh, seemed to have it all down. She would, she knew what she was going to do. She had no problems with it. And really had no need for it. I personally am not a look queen. I'm more of a get looks queen. Just saying. Scarlet was super confident that her creature of the Black Lagoon uh, was everything. And she was living for it. She was working that. But I have to say, I was really kind of impressed with what she was doing. Although no one else seemed to be impressed with her sewing. But seriously, that's just down to one of two things. Either she's not using a ballpoint needle for that fabric, because I've worked with that fabric. That fabric is not friendly. Uh, or she's not using a straight stitch and she's taking too wide a step and popping her seams. These things are correctable. Something these other queens who don't know how to sew don't understand. I'm just saying, pick up a skill. And everyone in the workroom was confident that Ariel's mermaid costume sucked hard cheese. Unless, of course, you were eight years old. Seriously. And then it was on to the runway. And I just have to say, I absolutely hated this look on RuPaul. It looked like a sequin house coat or a sequin bathrobe or something. I don't know. It just, uh, I just, I did not like it this dress. No offense to anyone. I'm not saying she looked bad. I just didn't like the dress. Of course, what I did like was Rude's guest judges, uh, Cara DeVanier, and the ageless Elvira Mistress of the Dark was there as well. Seriously, somebody better check her attic for a portrait because she is not aging. Do you know she's like close to 70? Seriously, I don't even look that good when I'm half her age. Now, I'm not going to go through all 33 looks that went down that runway, but I am going to talk about my faves. My first fave, ironically enough, was Ariel's first look, her uh, Silent Hill uh, needle repository, whatever the heck that was. I have to say, it was unexpected from her. It still looked like her. Uh, you know, it's big hair and weird shapes in the costume. But I really like that it seemed to be that step out of her comfort zone as far as her looks go, which seems to be clearly a running problem with everybody. Seriously. Sugar Kane's best look was her second one, Bloody Mary. Oh, it was unsettling. It was creepy. And I, for me, it ticked all the witch boxes that I care to tick. It sounds rude. And say what you want about Scarlet's obsession with herself, but her creature of the Black Lagoon was delicious. She looked great. I love the way she worked it. Seriously, I'm surprised with what she pulls together sometimes. Here's to you, Scarlet. Of course, who didn't love Evie's Tyrannosaurus Rex? I love her explanation of it. I love that it was an actual kid's costume that she cut and put herself into, uh, which ironically gave her that whole dinosaur or posture, and gluing those hands on her feet, those little dinosaur claws on her, hilarious. Here's to you, Evie, seriously. You can tell anybody what you think about them for all I care. Look at what you do. <laughs> of course, her dinosaur look was nothing compared to her sexy witch look. I just love that. I was so impressed with that. I went out and made myself a similar hat. I'm so serious. Not as nice as hers. But still, that said, um, it, those two looks were great. What kept her from having a hat trick was that weird voodoo doll look of hers that looked like an old 1920s housewife in a bad jumpsuit. I don't know. It was weird to me. I just have to say, for those of you who aren't Canadian and don't follow hockey, a hat trick is when you get three goals during a game. As for the rest of my favorite looks, they were all hat tricks. I am so serious. First of all, Plastic Tiara. I am just going to say, this queen is stunning. Her Playboy bunny, flawless. 
Her Maleficent-inspired witch, delicious. Her death goddess, so gorgeous. She made that whole look that day. Good for her, I have to say. I think that Plastic Tiara is not given the credit she really deserves. That said, though, three fantastic looks from Plastic Tiara. Here's to you, sweetheart. Good job, Santa. Somebody else whose looks just killed me this week, Nina West. First off, that Venus flytrap Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors look was delicious. It was so cute um, and just very uh, funny. Um, and then her witch, please, that Salem Pilgrim witch trial creature with the flames on the dress. What a gorgeous, gorgeous look. I have to say that was my favorite look down the runway this week. Um, over even Evie's witch, although they were both good witches for me. Um, and then finally, Nina coming out uh, with that weird... I thought at first, like, what has she done to her face? Like, I thought she painted it with magic marker or something, and then she pulled it off and then that underneath it. Fantastic. Now, I just have to say, I think that Nina was robbed for being in top three. Not that being safe wasn't a good thing for her, but I thought she had done a little bit better. I thought her three looks were stronger than Evie's, for instance. Like, I think Evie should have been safe this week. I think Nina should have. That said, Nina was still safe, and so was Evie. So here's to both of them. Well done, girl, Sarasa. Which brings me to Brooklyn Heights. Her mummy was delicious. And the thing that I love most about it, uh, not, not just because she was walking on point uh, the whole runway and everything, but when she got to the back of the runway and then went flat, she immediately started the monster shuffle. I, that killed me. I thought that was hilarious. And then her Enchantress, uh, which was inspired by uh, uh, Cara Devanier being in, in Suicide Squad. And then there she is. I mean, what a... Just a huge coincidence. But Brooklyn looks fantastic. That was a fantastic look at her. That jumpsuit was gorgeous. Now, one thing I will point out is that Brooklyn's wearing a lot of jumpsuits. But nobody's saying anything so far because I think her jumpsuits are so uh, innovative. And, and certainly her mummy and her enchantress were. The one thing about Brooklyn's looks this week, and I won't say I didn't like it, uh, because, you know, I did. I loved her um, uh, uh, her Black Widow or her take on a Black Widow. But it wasn't monster. Do you know what I mean? I mean, at best it was Lily monster. Right? Uh, but it doesn't mean she didn't look gorgeous. And I'm just saying... Uh, I think that she totally deserved I think it was a toss-up for me this week between Plastique Tiara and Brooklyn Heights. And I would have liked to have seen Plastique win only because I really don't think she's getting the recognition she deserves. But as a proud Canadian, I am not going to say anything about Brooklyn Heights winning two in a row. Here to Brooklyn Heights. Good for you, girl. You show all those Americans how it's done. Now, the looks that I hated, well, first off, let's just say it, a curious witch and her spider look looked like she bought them at the same store. I'm so serious. I just wasn't impressed with either of them, although she didn't need to explain them, which is probably why she remains safe. Of course, that wasn't the case with my girl Sugar Kane. I'm so serious. Bless her. Um, she did have to explain two of her costumes. Of course, that first one, that troll... I didn't get it either. And all the explaining she wanted to do in the world uh, didn't distract from the fact that she clearly had stolen one of Ariel's wigs for this look. Um, the other look that I just didn't get was her MILF look. Because apparently this was the, the, the bride of the devil, but she's always showing everyone her crotch. I didn't, it, she had that thing in her nose. It was a very muddy look. She had too much going on. And I think it was because she panicked. I think she felt that what she had wasn't enough. And she over uh, uh the lily, if you know what I'm saying. Seriously. Um, so it was no surprise uh, that poor Sugar Cane ended up in the bottom. What was a surprise was that Ariel landed there too. Not, not that... I... See, the problem with Ariel is she's very polished for what she does. But the fact that she wouldn't uh, monster up her idea of what a mermaid is... I mean, it, it just it just didn't make sense to me, uh, and and clearly didn't do well with the judges because there she was in the bottom with sugar cane. God bless. And um, I just have to say, this was such a horrible lip sync for your life. Uh, just to watch it because first of all, I don't think either of them were better than the other. They both seem to be doing about the same. 
which wasn't great. It wasn't fantastic. But then it happened. Poor Ariel tripped on that dress. Now, let this be a lesson to you. Listen to your Auntie Wilma, uh, future drag racers. Do not go into a lipstick for your life and anything long, anything that will catch your shoe, rip that, cut it. I don't burn it. I don't go out naked if you have to. But seriously, I don't understand why Ariel had that long thing back there. And what was ter terrible about her falling was that she looked like she was falling one way, and then the, the fabric got under and she lost all control. But it looked like she had been shot. Do you know what I mean? Like she was falling, bang. And she... And she went down hard, and she flipped around like flopped like a fish. Like it was just very, very traumatic to watch, and clearly traumatic for Ms. Ariel because she never came back from it. I mean, as as solid as she seemed to be after it performing, you could tell there was a desperation, like an overreach to be better than she could have been to make up for what she'd just done. And when it all came down to it, Sugar Cane was the queen that stayed, and poor little Ariel Versace sashayed away. Poor thing, God bless her. But still, five episodes in, well done is all I'm saying. She young, she got a life ahead of her. She has started Instagram, she didn't need RuPaul. Just say. So, there you have it. Another episode, 10 queens are left. Do you think that Ariel should have gone home? If she hadn't a trip, do you think Sugar would have gone home? What about... Raja, she got lucky this week. She slid through. Plus, it seems to me that Nina and Akiria, some of them are getting relegated to the middle, whether they want to be or not. So the only thing you can do is tune in next week to see who sashays and who stays. And then when you're done, you come on back and see me so you and I can compare notes. Now, until then, don't forget to... Support me on Patreon. Uh, you can support me for $1 a month. You can support me for $3. That'll put your name in the credits. For 5 you get your name in the credits and access to my tutorials before everyone else does. All of my drink tutorials are on Patreon, and they will not be released on YouTube until after RuPaul's Drag Race. So I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You want them now? 5 bucks a month. Patreon. Super easy. Speaking of super easy, I'm also selling merchandise on Redbubble. So if you want a Wilma shirt or a mug or any of that, redbubble.com is the place to go. i got the link down below as well. Now don't forget, like my video, because you know you didn't. Don't forget to subscribe because you don't want to miss fabulous stuff like my reviews or any other little thing I tend to put out. And until next week, miss me! Mwah! Seriously, boy. Emotional week! Thank you.